very proud to, um, to see this legislation pass in this House, uh, to have been involved in that process. Uh, I'm very happy to support the bill. Thank you. Call the Honourable David Parker. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Can I, um, uh, sir, begin uh, by thanking the Attorney General for the process that he's run? Sir, um, I think it concerns a lot of people in Western democracies that we see faith in democratic institutions eroding, uh, in part because we've got a very polarised form of politics developing in many parts of the Western world. Uh, we've seen it most obviously uh, uh, in the last year in the likes of the United Kingdom around Brexit and the United Kingdom leading to the election of Trump. We're actually seeing it we, we, so, in the United States, of course, yeah, sorry, United States. Uh, in respect of uh, Mr Trump, President Trump. And we're also seeing it in Australia where the polarisation of their politics, particularly on the right wing over there, is quite concerning. Oh, it is. You've got Pauline Hanson, you've got uh, um, people after 46 degrees Fahrenheit summers denying that they've got a problem with climate change and suggesting that one of the wealthiest countries in the world can't, can't, cl can't clean up their power systems. Um, sir, so we've got this. We've got actually got this threat to the public confidence in democratic institutions when the criticisms uh, from politicians get over the top, uh, and the media, of course, likes a good controversial story, and so they amplify the disagreements. And people who don't follow these issues closely end up thinking, "Well, geez, the system's broken. I don't really have much faith in my democracy." Now, as a parliamentarian, I, I, I think democracy is incredibly important. I think that the, um, the old saying that the only thing worse than democracy is the alternative is a, is a, is a backhanded compliment to democracy and about how, how wonderful uh, democracy is. Now, sir, um, at times like this, uh, democracy is called upon to sort through some very difficult issues. On the one hand, everyone in this party acknowledges that the SIS and the GCSB are here to stay and that we need them. I think the Greens are slightly uh, more ambiguous about that and would perhaps like to see their remit narrowed a little, but even they acknowledge that the GCSB, particularly around cyber security, are necessary, um, and they see a role for the SIS. Um, so if we all accept that there is a need for those agencies, and the next question is how do you properly regulate them, given that they've got these powers that they exercise mainly in secret, um, that include powers of search and surveillance, mainly on people from overseas, but also in limited circumstances upon New Zealanders. And it's the task of this parliament to get this balance right between the powers that those agencies need for the protection of New Zealand and New Zealanders, and the oversight that's needed to make sure that they don't abuse those powers. And I think we've pulled it off in this piece of legislation, and I think we've done it in a manner which shows that, you know, although our system lacks some of the checks and balances that you find in jurisdictions with a division of powers between a president and the parliaments, or between more than one house of parliament, even if you don't have a president, in our unicameral system, although we do have a lot of power vested in our smaller number of institutions, we also seem to operate in a way that gets these things right over time. And I think that's a wonderful testament to our country that here we are, this little country at the bottom of the South Pacific has just got this wonderful history of getting this balance right and therefore sustaining our democracy in a way that very few countries in the world have. And I say this when I'm out speaking to school groups. I say there's virtually no other countries or very few other countries in the world that have got the length of unbroken democracy that we've got. No one in South America, no one in the whole of Africa, no one in Asia. Virtually no one in, in, um, in Europe, because of course they've been disrupted by world wars. And you're left with a few countries like Switzerland, uh, didn't give the vote to women until the 1970s as it <laughs> happens, uh, uh, and uh, uh, Great Britain, uh, Australia, Canada, uh, New Zealand, for example, sir. And we, we really have been the carriers, I think, of really good uh, examples of democracy in action, and this is one of them. Sir, um, to, to, so that's, that's the positive. Um, what led to this was actually, uh, you know, we got closer to the brink of that um, uh, of, of uh, poor practice than we should have in this country. We had a number of things that had gone wrong. Now, I am going to list them again, uh, partly because I named the wrong agency last time. Of course, I think uh, the worst example was uh, Warren Tucker, then head of the SIS, and I apologise for besmirching the GCSB when I talk, talk, spoke about this in an earlier reading. He, enab he enabled a political attack against Phil Goff, 
uh, during an election, uh, uh, he, he gave effectively a misleading release of information to Whale Oil, who we know at the time was acting in league with the Prime Minister's Department. By that, I don't mean the Department of Prime Minister and Cabinet. When I said that uh, at an earlier uh, contribution, some people said I was criticising DPMC. I'm not. I was talking to the Prime Minister's own internal uh, office. Anyway, there was collusion uh, between Whale Oil um, and the SIS knew that this position had been uh, misrepresented, didn't correct the record, and therefore there was a political attack which was brought by the then Prime Minister John Key against Phil, uh, Phil Goff, um, and Warren Tucker didn't correct the record. That was only came into, um, into uh, the light of day some years later when the Inspector General uh, of the security agency, Cheryl Gwynne, um, showed what had happened. And I think that came, in a time sense, came, uh, came up after um, the Nikki Hager book had been published. So that was the first uh, and probably most egregious example. The other one was dot-com raids showed, um, and the litigation that followed showed that the GCSB misunderstood their legal powers. Uh, and uh, not only did they get it wrong, there was and apart, apart from getting it wrong, there was also ambiguity about some of their other powers, and that needed to be sorted out. We passed some interim legislation in this House, uh, and that interim legislation was, uh, caused protest meetings up and down the country because people said that that was expanding the powers of the GCSB to spy upon New Zealanders. Uh, that was denied by the government until right at the third reading when the Prime Minister, under pressure from civil society and also from the opposition, um, was forced to concede that actually, as drafted, it did allow quite broad spying on New Zealanders. And he said that he would not operationalise those powers, which of course meant that they, whilst they were permitted at law, he said, um, trust me, I'm not going to use them. Well, that's less than desirable. You should have um, those powers properly constrained in legislation. Sir, the, um, the third example is in the UK, and I've previously spoken about this, where for many years, Neither the Parliament nor the Security Oversight Committee there knew that um, data being collected from telcos, which included locational uh, information about pe where people were actually physically situated, was being collected and passed on, uh, and co collected including in respect of UK residents and given to the security agencies. No warrants. Um, no oversight. The only person that knew it was a minister in the government, and again, that had been hidden from the parliament and from the oversight committee for years, and that was wrong too. Sir, we um, uh, uh, have a piece of legislation which I think is fit for purpose. It gets the balance right. There are many people to think. I want to add my thanks to the staff from DPMC. I've been around this place for 15 years now. I've never seen a better process. The only process that is comparable was also a very good group of officials, including from the Prime Minister's Department on respect of emissions pricing, another very complex piece of work. And you know, I was really proud to be part of and see how good our public service can be. It was only possible because we had a minister who's on the top of his game. Prime Minister saw that he was, you know, there had been some mistakes made here and so rightly delegated this to the Attorney General. And he is a man who knows that when you're given an authority from Parliament to go forth and do something a bit like the Cullen Reddy report says, you're actually not slavishly bound by the first draft of the bill. Uh, less competent ministers, and we see them uh, in Parliament, don't feel that they have the authority or the room to move, um, and uh, they're less reasonable in their response. Uh, because of the Minister's confidence and his desire to reach out across Parliament for, the, I suspect, the same reasons that I've talked about in terms of the importance of democratic integrity around these important settings, um, he was determined to let the Select Committee do its work. Uh, uh, the Chair of the Select Committee at the time, who saw it just about all the way through, Mark Mitchell, the Honourable Mark Mitchell, did a good job. Uh, and we had great submissions from the Privacy Commissioner, from the Law Society, from civil liberty groups, from the unions, um, uh, from uh, the Inspector General of um, Intelligence, Cheryl Gwynne, who I think is an absolutely star public servant. I suspect one of the best on that in, in the world, actually, uh, uh, as well as many other individuals. Uh, and I've probably missed out some of the people like Bruce, Ro Sir Bruce Robertson, who came to us. Sir, the other select committee members who have already been named, and I won't go through them all, I thought um, everyone contributed very, very well, and that is a consequence. We knocked out purpose-based warrants. We got the definitions around type one warrants with the high-level national security term left undefined. 
um, but real limits to how far you can go in respect of economic matters and really focusing in on things like terrorism and espionage. Sir, I think we now have amongst the best oversight legislation in the world. We've got transparency with all of the things that have to be behind the scenes and able to be inspected by the Inspector General uh, that were not uh, until this period uh, um, are necessarily available to her. And as a consequence, sir, this bill has my unconditional support and I look forward to it being passed into law. Todd Muller.